Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stand here because those little microphones kind of scared me. I couldn't figure out what they were about. Um, in, the, in the spirit of the, the theme of exit, there are times when you do exit and it turns out that you have done something very wonderful on one side, but there's something that you fail to bring along. And that's what I want to talk about, is our failure to bring along context in the library catalog. So what if you did a GPS search and it gave you this? I mean, it gave you the actual point that, uh, that was the longitude and latitude that you asked for. Um, it's perfectly legitimate, it's true, this is that spot. But if that was all you could get, it wouldn't be very useful. It wouldn't be very useful without context. And yet, this is what we've been doing for years to our poor users, is they do a search, we give them an answer with no idea of how they got the answer, how that answer fits in with any other answers, what the context is for that answer. So I want to talk about how we got here, because I think it's, it's important to see that. And uh, so I'm going to talk first about the past, I'm going to talk about the present, and then I'm going to talk about the future, although I have only questions about the future. A little bit hard to compare what we're doing today to the book catalog. Um, <clears throat> It was a very different problem back then, many fewer items to, to organize. But the book catalog was indeed a catalog of headings. It was a catalog mainly of names. There were ones that also had titles and subjects. But it was a catalog of headings, and the bibliographic information was subordinate to those headings. So when users were searching, they weren't searching in bibliographic information. They were searching in headings. And the first card catalogs were exactly the same. As a matter of fact, the first card catalogs had cards for headers separate from the cards for the bibliographic information. And as a matter of fact, they even had the bibliographic information only once, and the poor users had to go uh, anything other than the main card, which is usually under the author, they had to get a reference and then go back to the main card to see what the bibliographic information was. So it was fairly inconvenient for users. But again, in the catalog, users were looking at headings. They were looking at an organized universe. They were not looking at bibliographic data primarily. When it came to printed cards, there was a major change. There were actually two major changes. When uh, we first started getting printed cards in the United States, it was the Library of Congress, began in 1902. This is a card from 1906. The difference is that what it made possible to have the full bibliographic information on every card. So suddenly the user wasn't having to dash all around the catalog to, to get the full information. There wasn't just one unit card. But in addition, the Library of Congress started putting onto the cards, as you see at the bottom here, other headings that they were using. So this was the first combination of bibliographic information and the organizational aspect of libraries, that is the headings. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> libraries would order these cards and then they would, uh, turn the individual cards into cards for headings. And I actually, one of my first jobs in the library was typing these, oh God, do I hate that, typing the, the headings on the top of the card there. Um, but we have a fundamental change now because we have all the information together and that leads us to the first concept of a record, a bibliographic record that has all of the information about that bibliographic item from the bibliographic description to all of the headings that are there. And initially, of course, the MARC record was designed to print cards. So this would have turned into a separate card for each of the 650, 700, 810, etc. In a card catalog, every heading was a separate card and went to its own place in the catalog. The catalog was not really a catalog of bibliographic information. It was a catalog of headings, authors, titles, subjects in a very complex, maybe not very good, but very complex organization. The bibliographic data was subordinate to that. Users 
approach this as approaching the knowledge organization that the catalog presented. And when they got to a place in that knowledge organization, <clears throat> it had a context. They could see other similar type of items, um, and they could also see where their interest point ended, as you can see between Caswell and Cat. So um, what I'm calling the catalog present actually is, for, for some of you still the catalog past, it's the catalog that I started working on in the 1980s, uh, which is that when we first started creating online catalogs, we were using the MARC record. And the MARC record, of course, we, as I just said, has the bibliographic information and the heading information on it. But it's all together in one place. It isn't separate in the same way that it is in cards. And we put this into a database, and I, I mean, I remember doing it, we did it, but, um, it made perfect sense to us at the time that we had a single entry for the, the MARC record that was, we had all the bibliographic and the heading information, and then we created indexes. And these indexes all pointed to that one record. So we went from creating three places for something to be to creating one place for it to be and everything pointing to that one place which may seem like it doesn't make a huge difference, but the thing is is that the user doesn't see the indexes. The user has no idea what the organizational principles are behind the search. The user does a search, the user gets an answer. All of the, the, our heading files are completely invisible. There's this magic that happens, which unfortunately may not be good magic. What we did introduce and what users absolutely loved was keyword searching, even though keyword searching by definition is words out of context. But prior to keyword searching, users were having a terrible time finding things in the catalog. How would you know that it's Lake Erie Battle of the Erie Lake Navigation? And why is it French American literature but cooking comma French? Uh, you know, this makes, there, there are rules for this. There are strict rules for this. They are, these are creative following those rules. The rules are totally, again, invisible to the user. So the users loved it. They loved it when they could first do searches without having to worry about what the possible order of things would be. However, the catalogers hated it. So when you do a search today, like I showed you that one for cat breeds in the Library of Congress catalog, you get these results, and you don't know why you got these results. And the order is not the order, the knowledge order that the catalogers have presented. As a matter of fact, it comes out in kind of just any old order, um, unrelated to the, what was searched on. And what the catalogers always asked us for in the 80s when we were working on this, and we didn't figure out how to do it, it may be possible today, I don't know, haven't seen any catalog that does it, is they wanted this. They wanted when you had a retrieve set that, again, it replicated that, that context that uh, they had provided through the headings. Today, when you do a keyword search, you can do a keyword search on something like Darwin, and the results that you get are all over the map. Uh, you know, everything from the person we think of as Darwin to Java. Uh, canals and Rivers of Britain, and uh, Science Fiction and Mystery. The subjects are as weird, so if we were you know, showing the subjects to the users, it might help them, it might just confuse them, but you can see why they would be confused getting just the bibliographic, uh, short bibliographic data. I mean, DNA viruses fiction, when you've done a search on Darwin, how can you explain to somebody how they got there? And I think most of us couldn't. Um, authors are just as strange. So I know that a lot of uh, catalogs have tried to sort of overcome some of this and also overcome the, the, the large numbers of, uh, of results by using facets. But I have to tell you that this, the things that we're using for facets aren't really facets. The author, that isn't facets. It's just a list of authors, you know, in, in the most, you know, frequent first. Uh, the idea that anyone searching is going to be helped by someone throwing a bunch of dates up on the screen, I think, is pretty ridiculous. Uh, that might be facets, but it's not useful facets. If somebody's searching, they probably are not going to know the, you know, the year of the book. 
You want to see facets, go to any of the sales sites. They're very good at facets where they have divided the, their, their database up into the things that they think their users will find helpful. Uh, and whereas we're using what we happen to have because we don't know what else to do. Um, we have a problem too of just throwing all this stuff on the screen, especially when there's huge numbers of it, when we could be showing people pictures, we could be showing them something that makes more sense in terms of what they've retrieved and we're very bad at showing. Um, and yet, you know, here you can, you can show, you know, where a topic began. Uh, users legitimately should be asking us where am I, where the heck am I uh, in this knowledge world that is the library. Um, and we could be showing them that, although it's complicated based because of the data we have. And there's no reason why the library catalog can't be used to do comparisons. There's no reason why we can't compare, for example, uh, one person and another. And this is Emily Dickinson, you know, a renowned poet compared to Rod McEwen, the worst poet of the 1960s in San Francisco. And you can actually, there are ways that you can show people uh, the difference between these. There, um, so basically, giving people a list of retrieved items in some order is not telling them what they need to know. Uh, this simply, I mean, to me, it's just so clear that this doesn't work. And what's amazing to me is that we've continued to do this. I mean, I, I first destroyed the <laughs> library catalog in 1982 by moving to a database and not finding a way to bring along the context for the user. And yet, <clears throat> here we are, and we're still doing this. So I'm, gonna, I'm sure you're thinking, well, okay, let's face it, the library um, headings and the classifications are terrible. We wouldn't want to use those. Um, I realize they're terrible. I'm not saying that we should go back to, you know, everything looking like a card catalog. Um, but just because they aren't perfect doesn't mean they have no use at all. If we could learn to work with what we do have, we would already have learned how to work with some fairly common concepts like uh, terms and related terms, broader terms, narrower terms, uh, navigation through hierarchies, and showing people relationships. So even if we're doing that with data that we think isn't very good, we would at least be learning that much. Now for the catalog future, as I said, I don't have any answers, I only have questions. And to me, the biggest question is, what should happen between a keyword search and a bibliographic display? Going straight from a keyword search to a bibliographic display is just not good enough. It does not help the users. It is like giving you that GPS point, not telling you how to get there, or what country it's in, or anything else about it. So we have to find something that, that we can do that, that be, is a knowledge base, because otherwise we're just doing an inventory. And if, if we users come into the library today knowing that all they can do is look up a known item, because the catalog doesn't provide them with any way to find anything else, to find topics, to uh, explore ideas. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, we have like two generations now of users that we've trained to this very limited view of the catalog. But something really should happen between the, the search that the user does and us giving them bibliographic information. Another question is, can we make a retrieve set of thousands of records, uh, bibliographic records, useful? That, uh, you know, that one of our problems today is the sheer size of our catalog. How do we, uh, the, the problem there is much different to what someone had in the book catalog or even in the card catalogs. How do we make this a usable um, machine, basically? And when is it that we should be showing the users the bibliographic data, the actual bibliographic record? I mean, how, we could probably take them through. In the card catalog, they went through uh, looking at headings, looking at see also references, finding where they were before they drilled down to the bibliographic record. Can we figure out at what point that that is useful for them, that they need that? 
Now, I know many people are hoping that we will have the automated analysis of topics, and therefore we won't have to you know, resort to some of the things that we have today in bibliographic data. And like artificial intelligence, this is always like coming soon. And every day it's coming soon, and every day it's coming soon, and we never seem to get there. I did a search in the uh, Public Library of Science, just came up with a new knowledge map, so I searched for the word classification, and I got monkeys, eye movements, and loudspeakers. Um, again, this is a problem of, I have no idea what, how classification brought me up those, but clearly we've got a ways to go in this, which tells me that we can't wait for this. We have to come up with something, uh, and we can't just say, well, one day it'll be solved by somebody else. Can linked open data help us uh, provide this context? Well, it might, but we could do just as bad a catalog with linked open data as we can with the MARC record and the data we have today. Um, I'm hoping that linked open data can allow us to provide more relationships, more navigation, something that doesn't just go from keywords to bibliographic records. Uh, what I see so far is that there is still a lot of that, you know, keyword to bibliographic record happening. So we have to be thinking about how it can solve this problem. It's not going to automatically solve the problem. We might be able to use it to solve the problem. And there's always the question, well, Google can do it, so why can't we? I mean, Google can provide searches in huge areas and, uh, you, know, this, this, you know, the entire web. And why can't we do that? And I think we ought to just forget about Google. Uh, we aren't Google, we don't have their money, we don't have their power, uh, we don't have their goals. We aren't trying to get users to, uh, as quickly as possible, to the product they're looking for. Uh, we, Google provides no knowledge organization. It provides almost nothing in terms of navigation. You can get some really, really strange re um, results with Google. And I'll tell you, because I seem to have the time, I'll tell you a little story. Sometime around 1997, I found myself in a parking lot at Stanford University talking to a guy named Paige, telling me that his little brother, Larry, had invented a new way to search the internet. And I said, well, is it going to be based on keywords? And he said, yes. And I said, well, it's not going to be any good. <laughs> and he and I had this argument about keywords versus knowledge organization. But because I stuck to my guns, um, I was not one of the people who was at that same meeting who was asked to invest in his little brother's company. And so I'm one of the people, one of the few people who are at that meeting who don't have to be kicking myself for not having said yes and now being a billionaire. So keyword, my hate of keyword searching saved me from having regret, which I think is a really positive thing. But anyway, we aren't Google. We shouldn't try to imitate Google. The Google single search box has great limitations, and definitely it only works for very shallow searching. So I think it's completely legitimate that users should be able to ask, where am I, when they're in the library catalog, and we should provide them with an answer. They should be able to see, and I don't care how many of these different knowledge organizations there are, we could have dozens, everybody could have their own, you know, it could be like the Memex. I'm, I'm completely agnostic on that. But everyone should be able to ask the question, where am I, and get an answer that makes sense to them. And we've spent so much time lately, the last 20 years, which is lately, remodeling our bibliographic data. And very little has been said about what is the model for the catalog, for the catalog that that bibliographic data is in. We've had Ferber, RDA, BibFrame, you name it, and none of these are looking at the catalog as a knowledge organization system. And I think this is a real loss at this point, and it's only if we can provide this that I think that we will win back our users, because they aren't just inter interested in bibliographic entities, they are interested in finding information. And that's that. <laughs> so, thank you. So we do have time for questions. Yes, you're all together too punctual, I'm afraid. <laughs>
Uh, we have lots of time for questions, and I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of questions. Please. Thank you, Karen. Um, this is Ken Chat from Ken Chat Consulting. A partial solution I would suggest, only in a very limited, but in a limited way, was um, certainly in the UK and in Australia, people have been buying alternative catalogues. So 70% of UK HE is buying what they call a reading list system, which is another kind of catalogue, which deals with some of the context issues. What it says is, I'm a first year undergraduate in my second week of the course, so it provides the context about me, and then it provides the context of the resources by saying, here's what you should read today, and here's how it relates to what you're going to read next week, and here's how it relates to what you're going to re read in your third year, and interestingly, sometimes, here's how it relates to what people at other universities. So it's not exactly what you're saying, but I think why people have invested in these reading list systems, which seem to be a peculiarity of the UK and Australia, but now some vendors in the US and my stuff, seems to be trying to address some of the problems uh, that you've addressed quite rightly. Uh, but also, I think, importantly, int introducing the context of the user. Why don't we use that? Google does, hmm. but our systems, they seem to ignore who I am. And there's some use there. Anyway. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the functions. I mean, you know, there's a big difference if you're looking for a math book and you're eight years old or you're, you know, a, you know, a doctoral student. So, yes, we, we should be, be adding that context. Any other questions? Oh, I have a question. Can you uh, say something rude about further, just for okay. amusement's sake? <laughs> anything, anything at all. <laughs> anything at all. You say uh, that uh, is further not a solution for this kind of thing? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll say something almost nice about further, um, which is that the looking at bibliographic data not as a single record but at relationships between items and which in fervor would be some kind of rigid work expression manifestation but we could have something that wasn't that that painfully prescriptive uh, and still help users get to something so and it becomes almost like the recommenders you know so somebody looks up uh, you know, I don't know, they, they, they look up Moby Dick and you can say, okay, well, here's Moby Dick. And, they, you know, there's a movie about it. Hey, we've got the comic book over here. And here's the cliff notes if you're taking the exam tomorrow. I mean, all of these are bibliographic relationships. And I think that the extension of bibliographic relationships, which Ferber hints at but doesn't provide, uh, should... Um, give us the, 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 the impetus also to look at an extension of other kinds of relationships because that's a very, very limited kind of cataloging relationship. Um, there's, you know, there's no reason why we can't say, you know, the people who liked this liked that, uh, which is another kind of relationship which Ferber wouldn't recognize. So there, there are some, um, you could almost say something nice about Ferber if you, if you, if you call it not quite Ferber. <laughs> okay, thank you, Karen.